Isn't it great to be a Christian? The world's going to know we're Christians by our love. And we're going to talk this morning about wearing that precious name of Christian and what it means today. We welcome you to the Church of Christ at Lone Cedar. It's the first day of November 2015. It's quickly getting away and Thanksgiving holidays is upon us and uh, looks like you all got your clock set back right last night. So we got an extra hour of sleep. Should be anyone napping this morning. So we all feel good and refreshed and uh, we're just thankful to have you here. Uh, I see visitors today and we're thankful. We're blessed and honored that you come our way and we just want to always give honor and praise the Lord Jesus Christ who w- wakes us up every morning, who gives us our life. It's in him we live, move, and have our very being. And let's never take any of these blessings for granted that our God has given us. I ask you to keep a little girl in your prayers. Her name is Haley Murray. We announced about her Wednesday night. Many of you know Haley. She was a student at Rogers High School, 21 years old. And uh, I was called over to Helen Keller Hospital yesterday evening, and Haley was in the ICU unit there. She has stage 4 ovarian cancer, and uh, her kidneys had stopped functioning. And uh, we talked with the family, and she was transported to UAB. She's in the uh, unit there at UAB. I talked this morning with them. The kidneys are functioning a little, but Haley needs our prayers. Uh, this has all come upon her very quickly, and uh, we want to pray for Haley, and I ask you to say a special prayer for her today and tonight and always, and let's pray that God can be with her, that she can overcome this sickness. Let's remember to thank God for all those that he has uh, blessed back to their health and through surgeries and through procedures and through treatments, and let's never forget to say thank you, Lord, because he has answered so many of our prayers so favorably, and Jesus is the great physician, and uh, it's through him that all things are possible. Our doctors can only do what God allows them to do, and God gives us great doctors and, and means and physicians and facilities today, but it's still the Lord that's the healer, and doctors will tell you that they can only do so much, so Let's leave it in the hands of God and the great physician and pray for all of these that we need to pray for. Invite you back tonight at 6 o'clock. Let's all be back this evening to worship our great God at that time. And I wouldn't, again, want the Lord to find me anywhere but right here tonight if he came back on his day, the Lord's day today. In 1951 in Waterloo, Iowa, there was a court trial that got the nation's attention. As a matter of fact, that trial made the cover of Time magazine. And it was under the title, What is a New Testament Christian? That was the title of Time magazine in that day. And it came about because a man who was a, quote, fundamental Christian, had died and left $70,000 to his relatives who were fundamental Christians. And in that case, the terminology of that and the arguments that were put up to try and defend and try to define what is a fundamental New Testament Christian. That judge judge heard all of that. And as he heard it, he got so disturbed and so disgusted in that case that he threw the whole case out. And he gave the $70,000 to charity And that judge said, from what I've heard in my courtroom today, you can believe almost anything or nothing at all and be classified as a Christian. So he threw the whole case out. Beloved, I'm here to tell you this morning that the word Christian is not used in any broad terminology. That term Christian is used very selectively in the Word of God. I want to ask you, Can you tell me this morning how many times the name Christian appears in the New Testament? How many times does the word Christian appear in the Bible? Only three times is that word Christian used in all of God's word. In Acts 11 and 26, the Bible says the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Then in Acts 26 and verse 28, 
Paul said, King Agrippa, you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And King Agrippa answered and said unto Paul, he said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And then the third use of that precious term is found in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16. Where the Bible says, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let them not be ashamed. Rather, let them glorify God in this behalf. Beloved, that's the only three times this term Christian is found in the Word of God. And of course, that first usage of it, of those disciples being called Christians first at Antioch, talks about the change that's to take place in our lives when we become a Christian. And in Acts 26, 28, that second time, it talks about the choice we have to be a Christian. King Agrippa had the choice to become a Christian. We had the choice to remain lost. And as far as we know in the word of God, King Agrippa died without God, without Christ, without hope, and he remained a sinner. His response was almost, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And then once you become a Christian, that challenge to live a life that would glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, we see in that third time it's used. In 1 Peter 4, verse 16 said, Yet if anyone suffer as a Christian, there's a challenge. So we see the change, we see the choice and the challenge involved in that word Christian. Peter said, Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf. Beloved, did you know that word or that term Christian? That you wear is a God-given name. It's not to be taken lightly. That term Christian that you and I wear is a name that we're to never take for granted. You see, when we became a Christian, we started wearing the name of Christ. We were baptized into his death. Then we became married to Christ and we started wearing his name. I'm now a Christian. There's only one book in the Old Testament that traces the origin of that name Christian that you and I wear today. In the book of Isaiah, written about 750 years before the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, Isaiah prophesied about that name we wear. In Isaiah 62 and verse 2, when he foretold of the name Christian, Isaiah 62 verse 2, he said in the Gentiles, that's us, shall see thy righteousness and all the kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name. That's the name Christian. You'll be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Here, Isaiah traces that name Christian that we proudly wear and that name Christian would include both the Jews and the Gentiles. Later, Paul would say in Galatians 3.28, that in Christ Jesus there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, there's neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And it was a God-given name that was given to us, a name that was given by Almighty God that was to be an everlasting name, time without end. So we see here, that name Christian that we use so loosely today, is a name that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, when you walk out those doors, you're to wear that name with honor. You're to wear that name proudly and never be ashamed to own your Lord and to be called by His name and to give praise to His name. You know, you cannot use the word Christian without using the word Christ. We all have heard the phrase, you spell out Christian, and those last three letters, I-A-N, stands for I am nothing without Christ. So you can't wear that name Christian without honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, what were God's people called? What were God's people called? What was their name in the Old Testament? They were Israelites, weren't they? That was the God-given name given to them in the Old Testament. They were Israelites. That word Israel means Prince of God. They were descendants of Jacob from his grandfather Abraham. And Jacob's name, you remember, was changed to Israel. 
which means, again, prince of God. And so God's people in the Old Testament were called Israelites. And beloved, when they sinned, God was hurt. In 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 18, long ago, he said, but if my people which are called by my name that was Israelites. He said, would humble themselves and seek my face. Then I will for, heal, hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. You see how they were living when they were called by his name determined if they received God's blessings. And the same is true today with the name Christian. We're familiar with that saying. Sitting in a church house three times a week will not make you a Christian any more than sitting in a hen house three times a week will make you a chicken. You see, Christianity is a way of life, isn't it? It's not just wearing a name. It's what we do. It's who we are. Monday through Saturday, not just on Sundays. But it's a lifestyle that we live seven days a week. And we have a life to live, don't we? A life that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ by that name that we wear in everything that we do and how we talk and how we live and how we communicate and how the world views us. They'll know we're Christians by our love or our lack of love. If we're not living a life as a Christian that will glorify God and exalt His Son's name, then folks, we're not worried to wear that precious name, Christian. I ask you today, are you a Christian by God's definition? And what is the prerequisite of becoming a Christian? That we can proudly wear that name. In Acts eleven twenty one, we see that first prerequisite where the Bible says in a great number, believed. They believed in the Son of God. You see, faith is our very substance. Our faith is the foundation of everything that we are in Christ Jesus. And unless our life is built on a strong faith in God and God's Word, we know that we can't even begin to be pleasing to God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, For without faith it is impossible to please God. We know that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now there's all kinds of faith, isn't it? There's a weak faith. There's a shallow faith. There's a trembling faith, an emotional faith. The Bible says the devils actually believe and they tremble, but it's not an obedient faith. They'll not submit themselves to the Son of God. It's not a saving, obedient faith, but... We see that faith or saving faith is only a small part of it. There's a second element of faith and it's called confidence. And beloved, there's one thing that I fear God's people today lack in their Christian life and it is that confidence in Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, John had this to say to the beloved and he says, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. I've told you many times, when you as a Christian who is walking with the Lord, you pray to God, you'll get an answer every time to that prayer. Do you have confidence in that? Whether it's yes, whether it's no, or whether it's wait, in that answer to your prayer, whatever it is, it's for your best. Because God, who knows our past, our present, and our future, He answers just like we answer our children. When they ask us for something, we love them. We give them what's best for us. A lot of times we ask for things that we don't need. And if your child asks for a pet rattlesnake, you're not going to give them a rattlesnake. It's dangerous. But if they ask for things that are good, that's within your will, that you know will bless their life, you'll gladly give it to that child. You'll give your life for that child. And that's how God is with his children. He only gives us the things we need 
when we pray with that confidence according to his will. What about your confidence this morning? Do you truly have confidence in the Lord today that he loves you? That he hears your prayers, that he's going to be with you throughout whatever you're going through in this life, that God will never leave you nor turn his back on you. Do you have that confidence today? 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we shall have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You know, in Acts chapter 1, we see the Lord went back to heaven on a cloud. And Jude said at his second coming, he's coming back just like he left. He's going to come riding on a cloud. And if he appeared in the clouds of glory today, and the heavens rolled back as a scroll, and you bowed your knee to the great I Am, the Son of God, Could you have confidence today to stand before him boldly, not because of how good you are, but because you put your life in line with his will? John says that we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. (laughs) Folks, our confidence is to be in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in ourselves. Not some man, not some individual, but our confidence is to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to share this little poem with you regarding our confidence in God. As children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and I tried to help with ways that were my own. At last I snatched them back and cried, God, how could you be so slow? My child, he said, what could I do? You never did. Let go. You see, that's most of our problems, isn't it? We get on our knees. We have a burden on our hearts. We get on our our knees and we pray to God. We have a knowledge that he's up there somewhere. And we have confidence that he will hear us. But oftentimes, folks, when we pray, we get up off of our knees with that same burden on our heart. We've not committed it to God. We've not turned it over to the Lord as we should. And so we give it to God, but we snatch it back and we get on our knees and we pray to God. And instead of letting him handle it, we get up off of our knees with that burden still heavy on our hearts. Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, he said, For I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Paul had confidence in the Lord and not in himself. And as I've lived, I've learned that there's just some things, folks, that at times are just too big for us. I felt that very heavy in the hallways yesterday at Keller Hospital with Haley and her family. It was too big for me. It was too big for the family. All we could do is leave it in the Lord's hands. We're going to have those times in our life. We're going to need to dig deep into our reservoir in faith and have that commitment and have that confidence in God to know He is with us and he never leaves us nor forsakes us. And then another prerequisite to becoming a term Christian, that precious name we wear is the term repentance. Acts 11.21 says many believe and turn to the Lord. They believe and they turn to the Lord. So many today want a easy believism. They want to be a Christian, but they don't want to have to turn to the Lord. They don't want to have to have any sacrificing in their life. So we have to turn. Not only have faith, but we must also repent of the bad habits we've had in our previous lifestyle. Luke 13, 3, Christ says, except we repent or turn, we'll perish. And then... He tells us we must confess the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Romans 10 and verse 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Many just want to confess with their mouth and no one has to confess Christ daily with their life. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, If you'll confess me before men, that is by your lifestyle, then I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. You remember in Acts 8, 37, the Ethiopian eunuch made that great confession? Philip had preached, the Bible says, Jesus unto him. That's all it says. They're reading the book of Isaiah, and the Bible says Philip preached from that text. In Isaiah, he preached unto him, Jesus. And evidently, he said something about putting the Lord on in baptism. And so that eunuch said, whoa, Philip, stop this chariot right here. Hold your horses. Stop the chariot right here. You see, here is water. What's hindering me from being baptized today? And Philip replied and said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And in Acts 8, 37, he gave that great confession that we use today. That eunuch said, I do believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. And upon that... Philip took him down into the water and he baptized him into Jesus Christ. And after that, the Bible says that eunuch went on his way rejoicing. You see, there's never any rejoicing until we've completely submitted our life to the will of God. The great confession. And then as that eunuch, we too, again, must be baptized. Galatians 3.27, For as many of you have been baptized into Jesus Christ... You put on Christ. That's the final act. If you don't have faith, a strong, believing, saving faith, if you're not willing to repent of your sins, if you're not willing to confess the Lord, then being baptized is getting you wet. But if you have all those prerequisites that we see in the Word of God that the Lord asks us to do, then that baptism is that final act that puts you into Jesus Christ. I put this coat on this morning. And that's what Paul says baptism does. It puts us into Christ. It clothes us with Christ. We're baptized into his death. Romans 6 and verse 3, Paul asks, Do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? That burial is where we contact the precious blood of Jesus. Again, young people, it's not the water that washes away your sins. It's the blood of Jesus, isn't it? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And when you have your faith in the Son of God, you're willing to repent of your sins, confess that sweet name, then you are a candidate to be baptized into his death and put him on. And then you wear that precious name, Christian, that you can wear proudly and not be ashamed before him in this life or at his coming. I ask you today, are you a Christian by God's definition? Have you been baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins? If you are a Christian, how are you wearing that precious name? Are you wearing it in a way that is honoring the Lord Jesus Christ? Could you have confidence today to stand before him if he appeared today? If he called you out of this world, is it well with your soul? That you could meet him today. That he would walk with you through that valley of the shadow of death. That you would fear no harm in any way. For he says, I am with you. We love you today. We're all trying to help each other on that road to heaven. Heaven's too beautiful. You don't want to miss that beautiful place. Are you a Christian today? If you're not, come. Become one. But together we stand here while we sing.